Welcome back to What's New with Mead, episode 21. I'm here with BC from Doing the Most. Hello. We are here to chat about mead making. We've already been talking about it, but now we have that's to true. we actually have to hit a start button. <laughs> yeah, that's, on this. this is the official the, beginning. The official beginning. Uh, today's episode is um, about beginner kind of mead questions and whatever branches off from that. We're going to start talking about the basics and I'm sure end up in the crazy wild stuff here soon. So, glad to have you here. I'm glad to be here. And uh, this is such a different setup. Than it is. Used to this is uh, it's we're facing, you can't see like a side camera, but we're yeah. facing each other. So you can see him, and I'm going to superimpose, and it's going to be weird because we're going to be looking at each other. It's got a very like detective interrogation. Kind of, like I feel like there should be a really hot light bulb right there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, it's real intense. But uh, I'm up to the challenge. Next time, next time. Uh, I'll like keep a that in mind. Handkerchief. <laughs> we're good, we're good. All right, so let's talk about, first of all, what we're drinking. Yeah. Um, we have... Uh, we normally pass things between each other quite a bit. Yeah. So I, of course, I knew you were coming over because we planned to do this, and I uh, pulled out some beers this time that I'd done. So this mm-hmm. is uh, I didn't cleverly name it. This was the Down Under IPA that was a kit because I'm a lazy beer maker to be honest, <laughs> and I don't really likewise. I don't think that hard, and uh, not that I don't want to. I just have too yeah. much other stuff. So this is just an um, an IPA with some I can't remember what hops they are. Used a really they're New Zealand hops. Hop. Yeah. Um, what is it? Balthazar? I don't even know. Something interesting. Um, but they're two hops that I haven't used very often. And it's my okay. first IPA I've ever made. To be okay. honest with you, last time I tested taste tested it was not very good. But you know, I recently um, for a video project purchased a Mister Beer kit. Yeah. And I chose the IPA version. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, there's that. I, I, I have not tasted it since it's been bottled and bottle conditioning, but that one going into the bottles tasted like you're sucking on a rubber band. Yeah. And so this has got to be better than that, right? It's kind of, um, <laughs> you're I just want to, your reaction has me a little bit. It's just the aftertaste. Suspect. The, the beginning is very hoppy. Of course it's IPA. It's that the aftertaste of the hops that like throws me off the like three or four seconds later. It's very piney. Very. Oh Yeah. Like it's I'm, got a little bit of a Christmas wreath thing yeah. going on. <laughs> and I'm not not the biggest fan of that. Woo! Yeah, there's a pine needle. It tastes like you literally just put a couple mm-hmm. in your mouth and started chomping. And chomp not, like a, not like a junipery gin kind of flavor, but like an actual pine yeah. needle. Like if you were to make a candle and you would get the smell of a <laughs> it's pine like needle. like a Yankee candle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's this Yankee candle mead <laughs> pine version. You know, it's not bad. Um, it's malty. The nose is nice. The nose yeah. has a real good maltiness to it. It it the aromatics coming off the nose kind of deceive you about the body that yeah. you're gonna get into. It is thinner than I was expecting. Mm-hmm. I like a like a thick IPA, like a milkshake IPA. Yeah, I uh, I, it's funny. I I used to hate IPAs. Like, yeah. and then my first IPA I ever liked was the Coop F Five, which is like. Rock star. It is, yeah. but it's also like one of the hoppiest IPAs mm-hmm. I can think of. I mean, there's more, of course, now that I've gone further. It's pretty hoppy. To yeah, me. yeah. No, so it's, it's weird to me. I went from zero to 60. Yeah. And just like, well, oh, this one's amazing. Coop it's... F5 is the ultimate pizza beer. Oh, yeah. Like, we have a local joint here, Hideaway Pizza, Oof. and they have Coop F5 on tap. Mm-hmm. And like, that is my go to when I'm there. It's just, it's just like that savory like meaty umami of like a really nice pizza uh-huh. you know, well done and then just like cleaning your palate with that crispy it's, hoppy ipa it's just like it's dude, an experience. that takes me back to college oh yeah i yeah i did that so much i was that definitely that and i was blue moons of course mm. those were like easily accessible yeah like beers yeah. yeah i'm with you so no, i i used to drink a lot of blue moon shock top Mm. And oh, yeah, uh, I did a lot. Tecate. Okay. Like like Tecate in the can? Yeah. And you could go to, I think it was on the border, and if you ordered a Tecate, they actually brought it out to your table in the can. It was like <laughs> the most like lowbrow like, experience. Go. <laughs> and you're just like, you like know everybody's sitting getting. around with their like wine and margaritas, and you're like, 
in the middle of a restaurant. Solid. That's yeah. Solid experience. That's uh, that's like better than free chips and salsa. <laughs> Can't go wrong. Oh man, I'm. I did Blue Moons. What was it? There's another one. Um, I didn't really get into like anything really craft beery mm-hmm. until. I think when I could actually like buy alcohol at that yeah. point. Yeah. <laughs> so you know what I mean. Don't when say I that too loud. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. Um, no, I I started out on on bad beer, and and yeah, I think I was in my mid to late twenties when I started to become a beer snob. Oh yeah. And then like right two three years ago, I just took a turn into like wines and meads. Well, I like beer, and I feel like it's everything is getting super niche, especially if you go into. There's still a lot of great beers, but yeah, there are a lot of craft beer companies that are making these crazy things i mean yeah. i i have example i made a craft beer as well so right. i can't say much but um there are i have a couple standards there's one called the uh old Rasputin that's okay. like a stout it's like a bomb it's like 12 percent huge just big body beer yeah. and it i love stouts stouts are like my jam oh so i wouldn't peg you for a stout guy well I, that's what that uh, oatmeal cookie okay one is. that okay. and then i have a um cookies and cream milk stout that yeah. turned out pretty good as well all right so i've brewed a lot of stout i like one. a nice milk stout um or an oatmeal stout oh yeah something like that like a, a caribou slobber those uh-huh. kinds of like thick rich like it's like a meal kind mm-hmm. of stouts but i also like to just drink beer like mm-hmm. it's like a like a recreational activity yeah and so <laughs> when when you order a stout you're kind of like well this is my beer for the night yeah. whereas if i can hit in that like four to six percent range uh-huh. i'm just like sip all evening when i'm out with friends it's, that's more my style yeah i uh end up it depends on where i'm going if i'm going to like a, re- a restaurant and or if i'm going to like the patriarch which is a local place around us mm-hmm. who their beers can be pretty expensive i don't know if you've been up there but Mm-mm. it's no. um they're it's like six to nine bucks for a pour yeah and so you know you could get a four percenter for seven bucks yeah like, okay uh, am yeah. i gonna have one of these like over three hours or am yeah. i gonna no that's am fair. i gonna milk my money a little bit and try and get something that's bigger yeah but and stouts tend to be you can't really have a light stout. no you can't have no. a five percent no it's like I mean, to me like boches like you can't have like right a light right ABV Boche, in my experience. I don't know if anyone... Has... No, I mean, I guess you could, but balancing that would be tough. You, and you don't typically carbonate Boches. You right. don't... Um, they have their own, like, character. So I guess, yeah, you could add some maltodextrin or something to uh, fill up that body. But... See, now you're making me want to do, like, a cream soda or a root beer Boche. Ooh, yeah. Like a low, like a 4 or 5%, like, hydromel range. Mm. I I never well I say most are not carbonated. I've never carbonated one. Not to say that yeah. you don't. Just there's something about that style to me doesn't seem carbonated. But yeah, I've got a recipe. I should brew. It. It's been about a year since I brewed it. Uh-huh. Uh huh. That does use Beauchade honey mm-hmm. and some grains and some grape juice concentrate. Okay. For a a bottle conditioned beer like Beauchade situation. Hmm. I should, I should brew a batch of that. It's mm-hmm. it's interesting, but I, I, to your point, the Boche flavors are not necessarily the like the the lead singer of that yeah of that group. They're kind of in there as a supporting a side. Group. Yes, yeah, a... yeah. I, mm, yeah. I like this. This is not bad. It's gotten better as it sits. I think that first it, initial it taste, the pine, a was bit. a yeah. lot. <laughs> I think that's what's really thrown me off for a long time about it. Is the pine just see, so strong? I love. All the different characteristics you can get out of a hop aroma. Uh huh. And so, like, it does have a little bit of, like, yeah, like pine tar kind of, but it's not offensive. I wouldn't want, I wouldn't want any more hop <laughs> character. Yeah. But, like, it's interesting. It's fun to play with. Kind of yeah. like I was telling you about using the Waiiti hops in my grape ale, like, using a totally off the wall hop in a style that, it's probably not really intended for creates a really interesting experience Mm -hmm. in a way that makes you kind of notice and appreciate the hop. And that's what I like about this Hmm. is, is I feel like, yeah, like the malt is there, the beer flavors are there, but the hop really comes to the forefront and that's, that says IPA to me. Yeah, that's true. 
I, don't, I haven't really tasted many IPAs where I'm like, bro, the hops are not the main thing. Yeah. For sure. Well, That's, I don't hate this at all. Well, we're good. We'll Clearly, get to I've... the second one in a, in a few minutes. We'll yeah. uh, we'll talk about that. But let's go ahead and hop into our mainish topic. So as you know, when we we came over, um, we started talking about what kind of what are some beginner questions, mm-hmm. beginner quandaries that we see yeah. often within mead making. Um, and I feel like just to start one off, I feel like most people are lots of people see a recipe but still have questions about how much honey to use mm. and so i get a lot of questions about um how much honey should i use per gallon and mm-hmm. it's like it it's young mead makers who don't know obviously the difference between a seven percent mead and a 14 mm-hmm. and so like i think in my brain i i wish i knew how to give them an answer <laughs> though yeah it was more general like because obviously every meat is different every style is different right. so like when somebody asked me how much honey should i use that's just like an open-ended thing oh yeah how much money do you have how much, you know right. <laughs> right right and and like what what are you looking to get out of the honey yeah in that mead because you know it, yeah I mean, there's like you said also do you plan of... on adding more because then it's like mm-hmm. i think a lot of those recipes and i've even noticed it with mine sometimes factor in the beginning honey mm-hmm. taste or honey or recipe whatever but then you don't consider the after effects of okay well i still need an extra half pound to back sweeten right and right. i think that's where a lot of beginners get confused is something says three and a half pounds so that they throw three and a half pounds in right right unless they've read a uh, you know uh, step by step thing yeah and then are left with something that's dry possibly and right so let me ask you this: When when you publish a recipe, do you try and recommend uh, like a like a gravity to sweeten to, or a, a honey quantity that you use to sweeten to your preference? Do you make any recommendations that way? Um, no, I don't think I ever have. And and my biggest issue with doing that is that my recipes are generally like three quarters pound or three quarter gallon of water, mm-hmm. two and a half pounds of honey. So mm-hmm. you're kind of equaling out to that one gallon and then, you know, whatever yeast. Yeah. If you're doing right. it in a carboy. Right. Um, at least. Which is most of the time what I tell my people to do. Sure. And I think that people have a hard time getting exactly three and a quarter <laughs> gallon of water or they go overboard mm-hmm. and then they... So, like, I feel like it worries... It would be good for a beginning brewer to see, oh, this should be at 1070. Yeah. But... I, I don't know. I haven't actually considered adding those things. Yet. Yeah, I mean, and I, and on, so on back sweetening, do you, do you ever make back sweetening recommendations in your stuff? Uh, that if you it's a specific style thing, like okay. um, you know, if I'm making a something that tastes like a apple pie, you know, yeah. that's supposed to be sweet, then I'm gonna recommend, hey, yeah, I add this. I don't think I've ever made it an absolute to say that you have to yeah. back sweeten. Yeah. Um, and I feel like a lot of that's because some people, that's a scary topic for. Beginners. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's it's well, what what if my yeast keep fermenting? Well, and really? also, I mean, that's also another question I get is like, how do I back sweeten my mead? Which is mm-hmm. a great question, but it's like a rabbit hole. Like you don't just quickly. Right. You're not just like, oh, you just do it. It's like, okay, well, you have to do this. You have to stabilize right. by pasteurizing by, you know. Yeah, I mean, it's almost like or... a like a like a chart where you say, okay, well, pick from one of these four or five options. Yes, and then we'll take you down this uh-huh. <laughs> this. We need to make that because that'd be good for like people to see. Yeah, like if 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 yes, then do this. If no, then do that. Yeah, yeah that could be helpful. Um, yeah, well, so on to the topic of how much honey to use. I think uh-huh. you're right that it it is style specific. Mm-hmm. It's what kind of fruit are you using? Is it a braggot? Like like balancing the amount of honey you need for a braggot where you get honey character that complements the malt character Mm -hmm. is a really difficult calculation yeah and a lot of that's based on the individual palate of can you pick up on those honey Mm -hmm. notes uh i think there are recommendations though right for a traditional ish mead yes three to four pounds per gallon right um for me for back sweetening in a five gallon batch usually one pound of honey hits that mark Mm -hmm. but then there are exceptions based on balance like this capsicum i'm working on i added a pound of honey it was 
still not sweet enough. Add mm-hmm. another half pound, still not sweet enough. Added another pound. And now it's getting to that realm. And I'm like, how much freaking honey am I going to put into this yeah. thing before the, the balance of the heat and the sweetness kind mm-hmm. of neutralizes to where they play together. So you can create like a good starting point, I think, by a recipe. But then you're right. The the post um, altering of the flavor to get it to where you want to the sweetness level you want or the balance like you're talking about mm-hmm. that is like such a, a palate thing. Yeah, and it's so individual. Like you can't. To me, something sweet to me might not be to you, or might be extra right. sweet. So it's like. Starting with the base, saying use three pounds of honey, mm-hmm. and then at your discretion, add honey to taste, honey to back sweeten to your your right. preference. Right. I don't think it'd be bad for us to to say, make sure you add, you know, you're gonna ha- want to add somewhere between a quarter pound and a pound of honey. Right, right. But like to be specific, unless you're making the exact thing that somebody made, you're gonna use a different yeah. amount. Yeah, it's um. I was thinking stylistically, like, so my friend David, you've met David, uh-huh. uh, just brewed up his first mead ever. Mm-hmm. And he he calls me uh, this weekend, and he's confused because he's watching the video. And, you know, he knows a lot. He's made mead with me before. Right. He's never flown solo mm-hmm. on this. So he calls me confused because he's watching the video where I made a, the style similar to what he's wanting to do. Mm-hmm. And he's, he's like, so... You know, I want to use three pounds, but it looks like by the math, you're only using one pound per gallon. So is mine going to end up sweeter? And I'm like, you're just going to end up boozier. Yeah, <laughs> so let's right. like talk about what that calculation looks like. And so um, with the help of folks on my Discord, he like he he mixed it up mm-hmm. to a specific gravity that he was looking for. And like, so like I, it is, it's intimidating to as a, a new brewer to be like, where am I going to land in that range? Where it's like balanced, right? But it's also like playing in the sandbox of that style. But uh, it's that makes me think of beer kits. Anytime, like you know, this beer kit had a specific starting gravity mm-hmm. for. Well, it said you should be in the range of whatever ten forty eight, right? Ten fifty two as your starting gravity, and then you know if you do the right math and all those things. But then it also has a in a final gravity you should end at. 10 whatever 10 10 to 10 yeah. 14 yeah. <clears throat> for example now that stuff is helpful especially as somebody you know who has brewed beer kits mm-hmm. to see that and go am i in the right area sure. just to end oh i'm at 1057 hold on did i add yeah. too much not enough water what happened here um yeah but i don't know i i also think that sweetness it's Sweetness and booziness are the are two sides. So really, yeah. that next question, if someone were asking that, is like, I would say is, um, what? Well, you could say, do you like um, bigger bodied wines? Do you like mm-hmm. heavy wines, mm-hmm. or do you like spritzers? You know what right, I mean. Right. And then you go into the realm of like, okay, well, you're talking about a seven percent thing, so let's get you to one point. Right. two pounds for your gallon right or oh you like stuff that's 14 let's get you to right you know right well and, and also so like also in the balancing equation there's that like what are you going to do to finish this thing uh-huh. so if it's going to be bottle conditioned and sparkling you may want to add a little bit more honey than you thought you were going mm-hmm. to because that carbonic acid is going to change how that feels on your palate uh-huh. and like those are all I mean, you can understand why people just, like, start swimming in a sea of research trying to right. figure out how to do the perfect thing so they don't waste the ingredients and the time and the passion that they've put into something. Yeah, so. especially with honey. That's what <laughs> yeah. I saw. Um, it's, what book is it from? It. I have the book, and now I'm blanking on it. But it had, like, a cost per glass of mm-hmm. honey, mm-hmm. or sorry, of uh, wine to, like, beer to mead. Yeah. And it was, like, it might be old data, but it was, like, nine or ten bucks per glass of mead Mm -hmm. like as your as your price it's like a dollar for a pint of beer yeah exactly and so when you are factoring in such a um hefty cost for what you're doing yeah you definitely want to be right about it yeah it also kind of last little thought on that then we'll move on from it but it depends on your honey quality if you're using like yeah really cheap honey there's a good chance that 
uh, not that this this is a total guess, but cheap honey probably, at least in my opinion, doesn't give the most distinct, great honey character. Mm-mm. It doesn't retain, especially after fermentation. And I, I feel like I have good experience with that just because of the, you know, the blueberry honey you gave me. Mm-hmm. Um, the difference between using that and I bought some of that like $12, five pound thing of honey for yeah. Walmart. Well, pure and simple. Yeah. The pre- <laughs> yeah, pure and simple. And you pour yeah. that in, you use three pounds of that and you use three pounds of a, yeah. of a unfiltered, um, unpasteurized, you know, just straight up. Yeah. Good honey. Really good honey. And it's, and it like, yeah. sweetness pops out, uh, aromas pop out, mm-hmm. the just general honey character. So you're, like you're talking about more than just how much honey, it's the quality of honey. Yeah, no, I've I've made quite a few traditional meads. I don't, I don't think I've ever really put one on the channel. But like mm-hmm. I make them for, you know, personal right. things. Uh, and I've used a range of quality honeys mm-hmm. and a range of yeasts. And I think the most surprising to me recently was using that blueberry blossom honey for a mm-hmm. traditional. And and I only, I think I collected in at like 10.5%. You know, it's yeah. a low end of the, the traditional. But I used the Lutra Kivike yeast. Mm. And it finished out at 1.0. And there's so much like fruity, floral, perceptible sweetness. And so like mm-hmm. that good honey combined with that really interesting yeast created something totally different than if I was to use pure and simple honey and D47. Yeah. I mean, just a completely different product. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really, you know, you you look at a lot of new mead making tutorials on the web. I mean, you Google how to make mead Mm -hmm. and you come across websites where, I mean, they're, they're using balloon airlocks and bread yeast and things like that. And that's fine. That can make okay mead. Mm-hmm. But when you really start to explore, I mean, there are so many kinds of honeys yeah, and so many yeasts to explore and seeing how, I mean, you've done the tests mm-hmm. head to head. You can come two completely different products yeah. is really fascinating to me. That, oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, that's, that's my whole world. Right? You know, I <laughs> right, do so many right. tests where I'm like, what happens if you do this? You know, like I just, it's fascinating to me to change one variable and see such a, a drastic yeah. end result. Yeah. Um, I mean, we've, you know, we've experienced that in our own, in our <laughs> right. own brewing, in our own um, series that we've created. So, yeah, I just, to answer, I think the short answer, I don't know if you agree, is if a beginner is asking how much honey to use, mm-hmm. you got to ask a few extra questions. Mm-hmm. First one being, what kind of, let's say, wine do you like? Mm-hmm. Because that's probably what most people have tried. And then you can say spritzers or you can say you know, whatever, full bodied. And then you go for, and then you ask them budget. I mean, yeah. that sounds yeah. silly to, to talk money, but if but, they only have 15 bucks to make a mead, which is fine, you could yeah. do it. Then that pure and simple honey is the route to go. Yeah. But if they're, you know, if they're saying, well, I could spare 30 bucks. Okay, cool. Let's, let's get you a little higher quality honey. Mm-hmm. Maybe try this one. Yeah. And, what like monofloral honeys. Mm-hmm. Like something that comes from a very specific, even if it's, you know, like the alfalfa honey. I yeah. recently bought alfalfa honey. Not super expensive compared mm-hmm. to wildflower honey. But having that monofloral source where you're getting that real specific character from a specific plant changes the game. Yeah. Particularly on a traditional meat. Absolutely. That's, I don't, well, not that you can't make a good traditional with wildflower, but. Absolutely can. You can. I think it's just easier to make it when you're being more specific mm-hmm. with your flavors. Yeah. yeah. You're not getting as many. I've made okay meads with wildflower honey. Yeah. I mean, and that's all I used in the beginning was like. It's good for a lot of things like bocheting. Uh-huh. You know, where you can get some cheap honey and do something interesting to it mm-hmm. to add that character. Mm-hmm. But. So that's that's yeah. one of my, um, one I've gotten. Have you received any, mm-hmm. What what's a common question you've seen possibly in your channel or experience on youtube so far yeah i i think i'm trying to think of like i i feel like both of our channels have a lot of like intermediate level that's true brewers yeah so a lot of the questions that i'm seeing are are not always um like basic beginner questions Mm -hmm. um so it's it's like hard for me to think of like oh there's a there's an FAQ but I think bottle conditioning has a lot of people yeah. confused 
I think there's a lot of conflicting information out there mm-hmm. about it. And there's a lot of dangerous information well, it's, out there. Well, it is, it's iffy. I mean, I was scared <laughs> to do it for a long time, too, because, first of all, I, I don't know if there's, I haven't seen it, a chart that says 1010 is a good, is, is mm-hmm. semi, assuming your yeast can chew through it, is a whatever, this level of carbonation. Right. 1015 is this level of carbonation, uh-huh. assuming your yeast can handle it. So I, there could be out there. I could be making that up, and maybe I haven't done my research to figure that out. But stuff like that, because I haven't seen it, made bottle conditioning scary. Yeah, really intimidating. Yeah, and you know, storing it if you store it wrong, and then uh-huh. um, realizing that you know if you bottle condition, and then you open that lukewarm bottle, that it tends to carbonate more, at least from what I've seen, than when you stick it in the fridge <laughs> for a couple hours like yeah that scared me too because i opened up a uh, a bottle one time and it was like what is happening you know yeah, what i mean like, like a geyser yeah for example i opened up one of these last night to um i was actually pouring it out so, <laughs> <laughs> so but i opened it and it was just like shh, like going crazy uh-huh. the same bottle and the, they're all bottle conditioned this one came from the fridge it didn't explode yeah but the yeah. other one room temp just ex- not exploded but definitely overflowed overflowed quite yeah, a bit yeah so if you don't understand that yeah. your first time bottle conditioning having not you know put it in the fridge you yeah. go oh my gosh i messed up yeah yeah so yeah i'm trying to think it's i feel like i've lost my memory of the first time i bottle conditioned it was a while ago mm-hmm. um but i do i think my biggest anxiety that i can recall over bottle of conditioning was making sure that the priming sugar had been properly mixed yes. across the batch. Mm-hmm. Um, that, I, I, that I wasn't getting like a layer of thick syrup at the bottom and then just regular mead or beer on top, but like making sure that it had all mixed. And I think the first time I bottle conditioned, I racked it onto the priming sugar and then racked it again mm-hmm. so that it had like two times yeah. to mix the sugar. Yeah, uh, And I think, obviously I've been become more confident mm-hmm. in that process since but also kegging sure is nice oh my gosh i wish <laughs> it's a world changer do you want to try this one yeah let's All go right, ahead and think about it um okay so and then not to stop where you're at but <laughs> you're good um i re- realize i'm getting empty here so this is a <laughs> this going. is from crafted artisan meadery this is okay. a vanilla and cinnamon mead it's a traditional mead plus well meth i guess technically because of this, the um, spices. Okay. I've had it for a year, plus however long it was bottled pre. Mm-hmm. Definitely sweet, but I did a meat review on it last week. And so that's okay. actually out on this channel. So oh, if nice. you're wanting to watch this meat review, just click the card right up <laughs> yeah, here. And... Where I do legit. <laughs> yeah. So um, I'll be curious to see what you think. The nose is not. Um delicate it's got some it seems a little chemically to me i was gonna say i i sense a little sulfur in there yeah i don't know hmm i don't know if that's like i can't recall i guess i could look on the bottle if they include sul sulfites or sorbates but i don't think they do it's a 12 percent um, yeah i don't get any of it in on the palate but there's definitely a little little cloud of sulfur hanging over the top of it. They don't they don't say that it has sulfite or sorbates in it. So you would hope that if it did, they would include that info. Um, well, yeah, it it depends on how many parts per million, whether or not they're required, they're required to. to. Yeah. But it's very sweet. It's very desserty. Uh, it to does me. contain oh, it does? sulfites. Oh, yeah, it's that snuck up at the top. Oh, there's there. Um, it is sweet. It's, it's not unbalanced, though. No, it's not bad. I don't get as much... I get a lot of honey character. I do get a... Um, I don't get a lot of... I'm not pulling any cinnamon on this. Yeah. It's more like that... that I think we talked about it before. The exhale, the inhale. Mm-hmm. Like, exhale mm-hmm. kind of factor. Less less uh, taste. So, it's it, not bad. It's not bad. No, it's... I could, I could do a little bit more cinnamon. The vanilla character in there is nice, though. Mm-hmm. It's like, like drinking a dessert. This does make me want to try something like this. Yeah. Just because 
you know, every time I taste something like this, I'm like, I wonder if I could make something similar. You know, I always, anytime I have a commercial mead like this, I always wish I had two bottles so mm-hmm. I could pour one into a graduated cylinder and, and just check see the gravity. What the... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm always, I'm always curious. I guess because... you could just drink from the cylinder, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> just tip one back. But like to know where, where they actually hit on mm-hmm. that gravity to, to, because you, then you can kind of calculate. Yeah. Well, every time I, yeah, that's, that's a good point. Cause every time that like I make a sweet mead and it ends at like. 10, 15, 10, 20. I'm like, holy cow, this thing's going to be right, super sweet. Right. But this thing probably hit 10, yeah. 20. You know, I don't, I can't say for sure, but. Yeah. No, it's, it's very sweet, but it doesn't, it doesn't go past that range of being like cloying or uh-huh. sticky. It's just sweet. Yeah. I really enjoy getting to, to taste all these. And, you know, we were talking about before the, the vino shipper and being mm-hmm. able to purchase meads and right. I, I always promote that and I'm sure you do too of just trying other meads like mm-hmm. getting online and looking at Meridian Hive or you know whatever you're gonna yeah, find superstition yeah something where yeah. you you know from other people that they're good right. and like just ordering a bottle yeah and I don't I don't think I understood the um, uh, importance of that until probably a year ago because mm-hmm. I had made all my first meads <laughs> then, um, and never tasted anybody else's. Yeah, yeah. Like I just, I was like, this is what meat is based off my own interpretation. Yeah. And that was kind of, it's not great. Yeah. It's, it can be both. And I'm, I'm sure you've experienced this having gone to some mead festivals, but it, or competitions, whatever, but it, it can be both a positive and like a, a oh, yeah, learning experience. Yeah. Because uh, Dave and I went, um, year before last, we went to Texas Mead Fest, mm-hmm. tried some really great mead. Mm-hmm. Also tried some mead that I was a little uncertain if it was safe to drink right. f- from meaderies. Right. And so it's also like, wow, here here is a thing that I could be doing better. And mm-hmm. also, uh, well, at least my mead doesn't taste like that. Right. Just because, <laughs> I think to that point, just because people are selling it does not mean it's, yeah. it's good. That's why I think... Uh, I was saying, to to go with the ones that people are 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 award winning, like Superstition, mm-hmm. who has won many awards. Does yeah. that to say that everything they make is good? Right, is, right, is a top of the line. No, but they have some stuff that's clearly done well. So yeah. they have a method. I, I would definitely encourage people to try yeah. stuff, and it costs Absolutely. some money. Here's the problem, and I even have a problem with it sometimes. Mentally, especially if you're ordering shipping and you're paying 40 bucks for that bottle of yeah. mead that's 375 375 yeah and you're like oh my gosh like <laughs> i mean i'm not a big i don't buy super nice wines like mead is probably the most money yeah. i spent like i've got a uh what was it like i think it's a 375 from someone that's like it was 45 bucks for the bottle yeah. alone and so i'm like holding on to that like it's a child because yeah. I was browsing Vino Shipper the other day, and I don't. I think it might have been Sap House. Sap House or Superstition. Uh-huh. Um, and I was looking around. I was trying to find something that I wanted, you know, to order, and I I didn't end up ordering. But there was this one bottle that just sounded so mind blowing uh-huh. that I, I like added it to my cart. I didn't end up checking out, but it was a hundred dollars for a three hundred and seventy five mil bottle. But I was like That's nice. I have to try this. And so like at some point, hopefully I'm in the area and I can just yeah. buy it without shipping. But it's like like a really good mead that's been aged in a barrel and mm. it's like sat Everything for years. Aged. You know That's what Sap Sap House is doing. I know that yeah. yeah, I tried one that sugar maple of yeah. theirs. Just blew they have a, a barrel program that um, the Mead House actually has talked about quite a few times. And nice. That's a bunch of different barrels that they get from places, and so they're aging things in a you know, uh-huh. in a whiskey barrel or aging in a tequila barrel and, and all these things. So uh, that stuff is is good. I feel like if you can afford to do it, go for it. Yeah. But it's hard for me to justify a hundred bucks. Yeah. I mean, for for what would amount to two of these little glasses, basically. Yeah. But it's and also that really, like, experience of, of yeah. You can't really like save it well. That's part of my no. problem. It's not like whiskey that you can open right. up and like 
forget about it for yeah. a long time. A few years, yeah. Yeah. Like, you open up a bottle, unless it's, like, 20 plus percent, you're going to have to drink it yep. in a week. Which, again, a week is a long time to sip on something. But the tail end of that week, you're going to be like, hmm, I don't know. Right. This and at 100 sketchy. bucks... You better really hope you like it. Yeah. You start uh, cost per sip at that point. <laughs> right. Right. You know, one of the, the things that I see from new mead makers, and I'm curious your thoughts on this, is so I, for a while, kept a lot of acids and tannins mm-hmm. and things on hand. But people are really confused about, and not without reason, because this, mm-hmm. is, this is like next level stuff, but how to properly balance a mead. Yeah. And a lot of folks I know will use various other forms of tannin mm-hmm. or various forms of, uh, of acids. Mm-hmm. I've got a recipe I'm working on right now where I'm desperately trying to cater to a, a very new brewer. And so yeah. I'm trying to not use powdered acids and instead choose fruit juice sources that will bring mm-hmm. in some of those flavors. So can you talk to me a little bit about like what your process was? Starting out, not really knowing anything about balancing a mead, and to like evolving to where you are now. Are you using powdered acids? Are you trying to stick to lemon juice? And so I started off none of that. I'd heard about things like checking your pH and balancing in that regard. Um, that was probably one of the first things I heard about was like how to balance the pH level of it and get that the acid under control. And mm-hmm. I was like, too much. That's too much math. Too much yeah. science. Don't care about that. And then I started to hear about tannin stuff and, you know, understanding what tannins were. Mm-hmm. And I, I, for a long time, I, I knew what the concept was, but I didn't, could not put a taste to it. I couldn't take an AB and say, this has tannin added, this doesn't, until I started to do things that had more possible tannic value. Like when I really made my first big bodied apple mead uh-huh. that had I left the skins on and of course you know the the meat of the fruit itself added some body as well yeah. and that, that um, pectin does its own thing but the understanding the mouthfeel that, that tannins add in general yeah. also using tea I realized that using tea helped me with one of those but the beginning didn't care midway through didn't care at this point my understanding of balancing things is solely on my own palate yeah. in comparison yeah. to meads like this to understand this is what a, a this and many others are what a, an atypical body of a mead will taste like and an, an atypical bite of a mead yeah. will taste like and then I just cater my own taste buds to that to say this is what I like so I do use I don't really use powdered tannins I don't think I ever have actually Interesting. I think I've only ever, I've only ever used maltodextrin, lactose, and those are just body fillers, so not really right. fully tannins. I've used acid blend. I haven't used specific acids. Interesting. Okay. Um, I have done things unintentionally with like lemon and lime and stuff. Yeah. Not for the acid portion, but for the, the flavor. flavor yeah. that has probably picked up some of the acidic nature. So I would say like for a new brewer to... Unless you are somebody who wants to be a science buff from the beginning, like, mm-hmm. I would not be so concerned with trying to, to balance everything super well. And I think we, everybody has their their um, first meat experience where they create something and it's their first child. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And can see no wrong. And there's nothing wrong with that. But um, I think if your first meat is your best meat then then there's something up. Meaning, <laughs> like, yeah. if you've put thousands of hours into this one mead without experimenting and opening your doors to try other mm-hmm. things, you're not really going too crazy. So that's not to discourage, that's not to discourage people from um, using those things. In yeah. fact, I would say to... I'd recommend to do them. If I was a brand new brewer, I would not go too crazy with the, the uh, acids and the... Tannins, but that's just an opinion. So um, David recently got a, a beginner mead kit mm-hmm. from a, an online home brewing shop, and uh, it included malic and tartaric acid. Mm-hmm. Like it included 
like not an insignificant amount. Yeah. And uh, somebody in one of the comments on our video was like, well, when do you put those in? And, and I, I realized with that comment that it's not clear from this kit that you don't just dump both of those packets into your first mead. Yeah. Um, they're, they're very small amounts, uh -huh. and, but the point of that was it's interesting that beginner mead making kits are starting to include individual acids. Mm -hmm. Whereas, like you said, acid blend for the longest time was just the standard in yeah. home winemaking stuff. I think if you're following an exact recipe, that's not wrong to do it. I think that if you're, if you've made, like that case, a, a mead kit, you know, that has step-by-step -step instructions to go crazy with it. Mm -hmm. I think if I was just doing something and somebody said, gallon of water, three pounds of honey, love and D47, mm -hmm. um, without any understanding of what it means to balance a mead without instructions or without mm -hmm. something else, mm -hmm. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go too crazy. I'd be scared to, to be honest, because that stuff like acid, if you add too much, no yep. instructions that can tank a mead. Yeah. If you absolutely. add too much tannin tank of mead. Yeah. And especially for a new brewer who might not understand that that stuff doesn't dissolve all the time immediately. <laughs> yeah. So you're, you're mixing your acid in and then you're like, Oh, this isn't acidic enough. And then you go and add yeah. more. Yeah, or tannin. Hours. Tannin can take a couple of weeks to actually yeah. have full effect. And then next thing you know, you're like, what the heck? This is, <laughs> what happened? You know? Yeah. Like I did it to taste. And so not having that understanding. There's also the other side of it to me, which is like, part of me is cherishing the fact I had no idea what it was like to have acid blend or to, to understand a balanced mead. Because I can look back and go, Oh, that was what was wrong. I was like, uh, in my head, I was like, that that tasted, that didn't have like, it's kind of watery or, yeah, um, yeah. it just was like, it was mellow, like it didn't have any pop to it. What? Oh, it was because it didn't have any acid, it didn't have any acid help. Yeah. Or, like there is, for me, a, a hindsight to it. Yeah. Not to say that you should, and hmm. I feel like some people are going to take that as like, Go waste your money on things and, <laughs> yeah. you know, to learn. That's not the goal. That's not what I'm trying to promote. Yeah. I just think getting started, it's easy to go crazy and... Oh, yeah. There's there's so many fun toys at the local yeah. homebrew store. I was in there the other day and, I, I, again, I was like, man, look at how much money I could spend yeah. in here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I think that, f from my perspective, balance is important for the new brewer to understand because the last thing I want is for somebody to brew a mead, their first mead, their second mead, and mm -hmm. be like, well, this it's sucks. True. I guess I don't like mead. Because that's yeah. what happened to me. I think I brewed my first mead six or seven years ago. Mm -hmm. And it tasted like garbage. Yeah. And so I, I ended up pouring it out. I poured yeah. it down the drain. And I said, I guess I don't like mead. Because at that point, the two meads I'd had were Chaucer's mm -hmm. and the crap that I made myself. And so I do think it's important at least for new brewers to kind of like tuck balance into a brain wrinkle mm -hmm. back here because they may need it later. But right. if you make a, a meat and it tastes bad, like you said, if it tastes flabby, maybe just adding a little bit of black tea or a mm -hmm. little bit of powdered tannin might be make or break on kind of correcting. It's like a three-legged stool. If one leg's too short, you're going to be leaning. Yeah. But if you get all that into alignment... Suddenly, it might just pop for you. That's true. And I didn't so, think about that. I mean, part of my personality is like I messed. I my first one, of course, was YouTube. I did it on YouTube. Yeah. Um, and I was already driven to do it again. You know what I mean? So like, if knowing that or seeing a quote failure could be discouraging, if like your only experience is is that yeah. one or a commercial mead like Chaucer's, that's not necessarily. Good. Great. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I mean, I'm, I'm I think about just... it like any like say you say you decided you wanted to paint. Mm -hmm. and your first painting wasn't a Van Gogh. You might be like, well, I'm not a good painter, and yeah. just kind of lose interest. But you know, maybe you try a paint by numbers. Yeah. And see, like, okay, it's just about like learning the skill and where the color goes. Yeah, and, that's true. And how the brush strokes work mm -hmm. and just sticking with it. But without ever knowing that there might be just a little tweak you need to make to your process mm -hmm. as you're learning, you might just get discouraged and, that's and, definitely true. and give up. I didn't consider that 
Well, I, I agree. I, I definitely agree. I mean, I, <laughs> I'm I, mean, I trying feel, to convince you. You know, our, our whole world is in, influencing beginners. So, um, and of course, going further than that, but you know, yeah. we have a lot of impact in that regard. So I think that's important. It's just it's just important, if anything, to just remember it. Yeah. That never pour something down the drain, or 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 give up on something until you've exhausted all mm-hmm. the little tiny tweaks that you can make mm-hmm. to try and dial it in. Yeah. Because I've, I've dumped quite a few brews in my day. So I, I know where that line is. <laughs> yeah. I don't understand yeah. that. Yeah. Um, well, I got, let's do one last thing. All right. So you haven't told me what kind of honey this is. I, I assume you're not going to, I'm which not. is fair. Um, <laughs> Oh. So this is from a project I'm working on right now. Very smoky. Yeah. Oh. So that's funny. I uh I only know about this because we've talked. Yeah. This vial is for you, so feel free to adulterate it as much as you want. Man, world's tiniest mead. (laughs) Bro, you you literally (laughs) handed me the container. (laughs) Just pour a little water in there. I don't know how many milliliters this is, but I think it's a ten mil vial, so. Oh, I can't. Get, you got eight. To, big, you got to eight though, right? Uh, seven, I think. How, was it in this size? Yeah, it was oh. in that size. Get a big drop of that and tell me what you think. So this is applewood smoked, apple blossom honey. Ooh. And I think I nailed the that smoke is, on that. Yeah, the smoke is awesome. Holy cow! So that smoked on applewood for two hours. Wow. About every ten minutes, I went out and opened the top of the smoker and stirred the smoke into it Mm -hmm. and so currently i'm doing a sizer with apple juice and calypso hops yeah and eight pounds of that that's fantastic dude the aromatics coming off of that carboy right now oh i bet if anything stays in there um i'm gonna be pretty happy with it that's fantastic i i've always wanted to smoke honey in some regard isn't that interesting it is super interesting i love the smoky side mesquite honey is probably one of my favorites yeah because of the smokiness um, to it, and it has after fermentation a, especially in a boche, a whiskey. Like boches to me already have whiskey notes. Yeah, yeah. Like a slight whiskey note, but then especially mesquite. I was like, it's just fantastic. Cool. So, but this I get a lot of that vibe, but you get like the the fruitiness, the it the seems highly to have enhanced. Yeah, that. it's made it pop more, and it's, it's incredible. That's awesome. I can't wait to try this whenever you're. Oh yeah. I am I am incredibly hyped. I had invited you over for the smoking part, and then we had and this the, power outage situation. And then everything went. And so I, in, in trying to like get back on track with my brews, I did I did a beer and and smoking that honey and mixing up that sizer all in one day, uh-huh. which was like an eight hour day with yeah. all the different things happening. But I'm really hype about this. When you talked about it, I was already hyped, but now I'm even more hyped because this is fantastic. <laughs> it's so much. Well, and what's wild is the day that I smoked the honey, I mean, I was just just saturated with smoker smell. Uh-huh. So at the end of it, once the honey had cooled back down, I tasted it and I was like, man, this doesn't taste like smoke at all. I wasted a whole day. And then, and then like, you I took a that, shower yeah. and then went back and tasted it and was like, oh no, I was You're just like, picking up all the smoke. You just it smelled like smoke for like four hours. Yeah. Yeah. So no, I think it. I think it really took the smoke flavor well, but not in a way that's overwhelming. No, um, I'm. I'm very curious to see how that honey, that smoke flavor transfers after fermentation. Uh-huh. I know it's an aroma. Mm, I mean, obviously it's imparted into the honey, but mm. with it being such an aromatic base, I guess technically it could be. But anyways, I'm curious to see the result. It'll be interesting. So it's, I think it's. It should be wrapping up fermentation this week. Oh. Well, uh, but if this works gonna... out, I might have to come over and smoke some honey. Cause... <laughs> you are welcome to. Yeah. The smoker's yours. This is the, the best time of year for that. Right. Cold smoking. I wonder... Keep the temperature down. I think the temperature was only like 95 degrees yeah. in, the, in the smoker. So, uh, it works really well. Dude. It's my second time smoking I wonder what honey. a buckwheat would be like if you smoked it. Yeah. It'd be a lot. But... Um, we, we... So, for a project on one of our live streams, we tobacco smoked buckwheat mm. honey. And that was interesting. For one, because like as the wind changed, it blew tobacco smoke through. through. So we all had a little bit of like a yeah, like, like whoo, what was yeah. that? Uh, but it it carried over really well. It like perfumed the honey. Huh. Uh, 
totally different kind of smoke. But I, yeah, I would be curious to do like an applewood or a pecan or something like mm-hmm. that with a buckwheat honey to see how that complemented those flavors. Sounds like test for the future. That's for sure. I am so hyped to smoke honey. No, it, it was a lot of fun. Yeah. Like it was to like go out and just be like stirring this cauldron of honey with just like swirls of smoke everywhere. It was like, it felt very like rustic, <laughs> you know, it was interesting. So I, I, I saw on Reddit, somebody said smoked honey is great for fried chicken. So oh, man, I feel I like f- cooking may be the next foray for this experiment. Definitely. But I, I had not seen anyone do something like this with a brew where you're like using all the parts of the uh-huh. plant in all these different ways. So it like felt like very much in the doing the most realm of content. Yeah. So we'll see. You'll have a couple bottles. Well, I'm, I'm stoked. <laughs> Dude, this has been fun. I, thanks for coming over and this has been a blast. Know, I'm a, uh, we'll, we'll definitely do this again. And if you've enjoyed this episode, um, of course, do the normal things, like it and comment about it, but uh, specifically go check out BC's channel um, over doing the most, and I'll make sure and put it down below, but uh, he's obviously making some amazing projects, and I, I'm very hyped for it, you should be too, so um, thanks for coming out and, and chatting. Thank you for having and me. I, I promise you, we have some crazy stuff planned. We do. I we're actually, we've got a big meeting here in a few minutes, <laughs> actually, for uh, um, uh, um, something in the works. So yeah. stay tuned for the, for the news, and we'll see you guys next time. So cheers. Happy brewing. <laughs>